It's Friday, June 2. In the headlines, Jamaica is set to get some much needed rainfall. There's a trough across the island. In business news, goods producing industry falls. Regionally, Trinidad and Tobago's ambassador elected 78th United Nations General Assembly president. Internationally, Kenya's starvation cult leader to face court as hundreds missing. And in sports, a Jamaican is being considered to be part of the Windy's women coaching staff. In entertainment news, Beyonce samples Scatter Burrell's Cooley Dance rhythm. This is the Weekend News on PBC Jamaica. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. We start with a weather update. A trough across Jamaica and the Western Caribbean has been producing unstable weather conditions and is expected to remain across the region throughout the weekend. The Meteorological Service of Jamaica in a statement on Friday said as a result of the system, Jamaicans should expect cloudy conditions with periods of showers and thunderstorms to continue across the island throughout Friday into the weekend. Starting a Saturday, cloudy conditions with periods of showers and thunderstorms are expected, especially across southern parishes. Sunday into Monday afternoon, showers and thunderstorms are anticipated mainly across central and eastern parishes. A new chief executive officer will soon be appointed to run the Child Protection and Family Services Agency, the CPFSA. The Office of the Services Commission is in the process of interviewing candidates for the post. Minister of Education and Youth Favel Williams gave an update at Wednesday's post-cabinet press brief. In short order, we, they will let us know um, which candidate was chosen to be the new CEO of the CPFSA. As you are aware as well, uh, the Prime Minister recently announced um, that Minister Marsha Smith will be at the ministry as a state minister with a focus on the child protection sector. Michelle McIntosh Harvey, the CPFSA's Director of Finance, has been the interim CEO since April. The position of a CEO became vacant in January when Rosalie Gage Gray was asked to step down from the role amid controversy following a damaging report surrounding American Carl Robansky and his agency, Embracing Orphans. An Office of the Children's Advocate investigation cited gross breach of care in the controversial partnership between the CPFSA and Robansky. The road network is the backbone of our economy. Those words from Minister Without Portfolio in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, Everald Warmington, as he gave the House of Representatives an update this week on the government's work toward modernizing the road network across the island. During his contribution to the annual sectoral debate, Minister Warmington disclosed that the government is preparing to implement a $40 billion road improvement project to modernize more than 2,000 roads island-wide. The road network is the backbone of our country connecting businesses, industries and individuals across the length and breadth of the country. This administration considered the intervention as an emergency within the context of road-related injuries and fatalities. The budgeted sum includes fees that will be paid for services outside of the cost of construction. We will look specifically at corridors with an average daily traffic of over 10,000 vehicles or more. Two road condition. We'll also select corridors based on the existing condition, a pavement condition index of below 70 will form a key part of the decision-making process. According to Minister Warmington, under the Shared Prosperity Through Accelerated Improvement to Our Road Network, SPARC program, the vision is to create a transport network that is safe, efficient and reliable to meet Jamaica's economic and social needs. Some of the areas that will no doubt provide this spark in this thrust to economic growth. Kingston St. Andrew, Mountain View Avenue, 
Holob Road, Mullins Road, Walden Park Road, Constant Spring to Stonehill, among others. Other roads include Freetown to Four Paths, Crooked River to Penance Deuce, Whitney Town to Four Paths, Hope Bay to Orange Bay, Orange Bay to Windsor Castle, Rio Grande to Hope Bay, Halifax Bridge to Lucky Hill, Lucky Hill to Goshen, Port Maria to Islington, Alexandria to Brownstown, Discovery Bay to Brownstown, Ocherius Township, Albert Town to All Sides, Duncans to Long Pond, Salt Marsh to Kent, and Negril to Parish Border, also Ferris to George's Plain, and Negril to Negril Lighthouse. Time now for the Business Report with Danita Rodney. Welcome to the Business Report, I'm Danita Rodney. In this week's extended report, Director General of the Planning Institute of Jamaica, Dr. Wayne Henry, says between January and March 2023, the output of the goods producing industry fell by an estimated 0.7%. He says this is due to contractions in all industries, with the exceptions of mining and manufacturing. Dr. Henry shared the information during the PIOJ's quarterly media briefing this week. This performance largely reflected the impact of drought conditions and a slowdown in some capital projects. He says the output of the agriculture and fishing industry declined by an estimated 7.6%. The performance of the industry reflected the impact of drought conditions. This resulted in a decline in productivity as reflected in lower output per hectare, as well as a delay in planting of crops which contributed to a decline in hectares reaped for domestic crops. All parishes recorded a contraction in hectares reaped, with the exception of Portland and Clarendon, which increased by 4.6% and 4.2% respectively, relative to the corresponding quarter of 2022. According to Dr. Henry, other agriculture crops are estimated to have contracted by 9.6%, reflecting lower productions in all nine major food groups. The most significant declines were recorded for potatoes, down 23.3%, legumes, down 16%, and cereals, down 14.4%. Traditional export crops fell by an estimated 1.4%, reflecting lower output for bananas, down 3.9%, and cocoa, down 30.3%. On a positive note, animal farming is estimated to have grown by 2.8%. Mainly reflecting the increased production of broiler meat, up 1.9%, and eggs, up 7.4%. Increases were also recorded for post-harvest activities, pushed by a higher production of coffee. Now for your market updates. In foreign exchange trading for Thursday, June 1, the U.S. dollar sold for an average of $155.72. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $115.32. The pound sterling traded for $193.30. And the euro sold for an average of $167.79. In JSE trading, the JSE index advanced by 1,749 points. The junior market index declined by 13 points. The combined market index advanced by 1,509 points. And the All Jamaican Composite Index advanced by 2,332 points. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 102 stocks of which 44 advanced, 43 declined and 15 traded firm. Stocks advanced for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited, and Berita Investments Limited. Stocks declined for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, Verbal Preference, Access Financial Services Limited, and Caribbean Assurance Brokers Limited. Trading firm were Caribbean Cream Limited, Community and Workers of Jamaica CCU Deferred Share, and Express Catering Limited. The overall volume leaders were Fostage Company Limited and Trans Jamaican Highway Limited with over 4 million units, 
and his surgical select funds limited financial with over 2 million units. In regional stocks, in Trinidad and Tobago, Calypso Macro Index Fund posted 21 shares. On the Barbados Stock Exchange, Epley Caribbean Property Fund Development Fund was a volume leader with over 6,000 shares. They were followed by Epley Caribbean Property Fund Value Fund and First Caribbean International Bank which traded 333 and 114 shares respectively. In regional business, a regional trade and investment promotion agency says interregional transportation remains a barrier for trade and investment in the Caribbean. Executive Director of the Caribbean Export Development Agency says a way must be found to reduce the cost of interregional transportation. It is cheaper for many Caribbean people to travel to Miami or to New York or Bajans going to Panama than going right next door to Trinidad and Tobago or going to Grenada. And therefore, we really have to find a way to reduce the cost of interregional transportation, allowing goods and people to move much freer and at a lower cost. But speaking about these issues, this should not preclude us from the fact that I'm happy you spoke about emancipation. Because we at Caribbean Export, we fully understand that A, it's important to boost intra-regional trade. It's important to consolidate our existing markets but it's so important to penetrate and enter new markets. We at Caribbean Export believe that we see a good foundation being laid at the political level. But what we need to do is to create a platform for business to engage with business, to create business for the benefit of people in Africa, and of course, for us here in the Caribbean. In international business, U.S. stock indexes closed higher as signs of slowing wage pressure on inflation raised hopes the Federal Reserve will pause raising interest rates in two weeks. U.S. stocks climbed on Thursday. Investors welcomed both a vote in Congress to suspend the U.S. government's debt ceiling, as well as signs of slowing wage growth, suggesting inflation may be loosening its grip. The Dow rose half of 1%. The S&P 500 added 1%, and the Nasdaq climbed nearly 1.3%. Sanders' Morris Harris chairman George Ball says he expects the market to continue moving higher. The market is today reflecting relief. We're not going to have a debt crisis. The politicians have had their uh, uh, 60 seconds of, of great uh, outcome on national TV. Uh, that's driving the markets. The economy is not tanking. Uh, that's good. Job uh, openings are up. That's good. Now, and, and a big part of it is that investors and speculators both are of a positive mindset. And the, the interpretive bias is going to drive the market higher for at least the time being. A report from ADP showed wage inflation is slowing, while a separate report from the Labor Department indicated labor costs increased less than anticipated in the first quarter. Friday, the Labor Department releases the May jobs report, which could determine whether the Federal Reserve raises interest rates again at its meeting later this month. Stocks on the move included Dollar General, which dropped nearly 20 percent after the dollar store chain cut its sales and profit forecasts for the year. And Salesforce, which fell 5 percent after the software company posted its slowest pace of revenue growth in 13 years. In market data for oil, oil prices rose after a U.S. debt ceiling deal averted a default in the world's biggest oil consumer. Brent crude futures were up $1.21 to $75.49 a barrel, while West Texas Intermediate crude was up $1.19 at $71.29. And that was the Business Report on PBCJ. I'm Danita Rodney. Back to you, Simone. Thanks, Danita. It's time now for regional news. History in the making. Trinidad and Tobago's candidate for president of the United Nations General Assembly, Dennis Francis, has been successful. Ayanna Carter has the details. 
Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary and Permanent Representative of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago to the United Nations New York, Dennis Francis, was elected as the 78th President of the UN General Assembly on June 1st in the General Assembly Hall at the United Nations headquarters in New York. This is the first time that a nominee from this country has been elected as President of the UNGA. During his one-year presidency, President-elect Francis will preside over high-level meetings, shape the priorities of the General Assembly, and will play a crucial role in facilitating negotiations among member states. Calling it a weighty responsibility, the President-elect, in his speech, emphasized the influence a sound education had on his career's experiences. Over the 40-odd years of my career as a diplomat, it never once occurred to me that I would find myself sitting as the President of the General Assembly. But as I look back, it was my good fortune to have been schooled by some of the finest, finest and most accomplished diplomats Trinidad and Tobago has ever produced. Mr. Francis expressed what he hoped to achieve as UNDG President. It is my hope to bring forward, with your help and support, a renewed atmosphere of conciliation, cooperation, and shared commitment in addressing the many challenges and seizing every opportunity, however nascent, before the General Assembly. I will seek to enhance current approaches and adopt new ones with probable solutions as we endeavor to deliver, or at least, to strengthen the basis for delivering peace, prosperity, progress, and sustainability. Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley was among those extending congratulations to President-elect Francis, Minister of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs Dr. Amy Brown and their team for the successful campaign which secured the election in TNT's favour. Dr. Rowley said, as a leader among small island developing states, we confidently look forward to a successful conference under the theme of peace, prosperity, progress and sustainability. Ayana Carter, TTT News. With lots of discussion this week surrounding energy, Dominica is actively working on solutions. The Nature Isle, with nine volcanoes, is investing in geothermal energy. Crystal Hoyt has those details. Dominica is moving full steam ahead with its geothermal energy project, aimed at providing a stable source of electricity and reducing the island's reliance on diesel generation. Minister for the Environment, Rural Modernization and Kalanego Upliftment, Kozier Frederick, says the island's geothermal project is 40% completed. We have acquired land, so we have, we have done the injection wells, we have done the testing, we'll have more than um, 10 megawatts of power, and there, there's a scope for twice that amount in the coming years. So right now we are, we are at the point to build the actual plant and, and to, to, to um, move the power from the site to, the, to the, one of the major um, um, power stations. So far, the country has invested 80 million US dollars into the project. So we're excited about this. We have made major investments in that already. And right now we're working with the World, the World Bank um, to, to get the rest of the funds to build the power plant and the distribution lines to the main power. The second piece, we have already done um, some assessments of other parts of the country with geothermal resource. And in the next 10 years, we will be able to produce more than um, 40 megawatts of power across, across the, the country. The timeline for project completion is 2027. Within the next four years, we'll be able to... Because the layperson on the ground, he's only excited about geothermal. That's the normal guy on the street when it comes through a light bulb. And so we said in, 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 in four years' time, we will be able to do that. Don't sure we bring the power into the power station and have it distributed. He suspects it would mean a 50% reduction in the cost of electricity. While acknowledging the benefits to Dominica, he says the entire Caribbean should be excited. We're hoping that we, 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 can sell, we can sell power to the region. I, I think, I mean, the, the geothermal resource is so big here. Um, we, we, we will be able to, to bail out, I think. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, Trinidad with its oil was able to bail a number of countries. I think we will become that, that way in Dominica. And it's due for to assist a number of countries. Negotiations are underway for the construction of the 10 megawatt geothermal power plant. Crystal Hoyt, 
CBC News. Saudi Minister of Tourism Ahmed Al Khatib arrived in Belize on Tuesday. The purpose of the visit included the signing of a loan agreement with the Saudi Fund for Development to build a tertiary hospital. More from News 5. Saudi Arabia is starting to play not only in Africa and um, Asia and Europe, but now also wanting to play a more important role in, in all parts of the world, as, as you rightly said. You're a member of the G20, and as such, um, you have a, an important role here. Prime Minister John Bersenio signed a $90 million development loan with Saudi Arabia's Minister of Tourism on Tuesday. The signing of the agreement was part of a brief visit to Belize by Ahmed Al Khatib, chairman of the board of directors of the Saudi Fund for Development. The monies, as we've reported, will be used for the construction of a new hospital in Belmopan. Our objective it is to attain universal health coverage. These are to ensure that these opportunities come to Belizean people and building a, a new tertiary facility will only be able to provide that better service and access to healthcare for Belizean people. So definitely I want to thank you on behalf of us and the ministry, the wider Belizean people. The new state-of-the-art medical facility will benefit more than 200,000 citizens with access to secondary and tertiary healthcare services. Despite concerns being raised by doctors and nurses, as well as hospital staff with the KHMH Workers' Union, the facility will double as the university hospital for UB's Faculty of Medicine. Witnessing the signing of the agreement was Christopher Koyi, Minister of State in the Ministry of Finance. For us, I think we start we have to creep before we can walk. And um, we are a young country as well. We're 40 years. Um, we have been able to uh, develop formal relations, diplomatic relations with yourselves. And, and we look forward to deepening that relationship. We are appreciative. Prior to signing, a bilateral meeting was held during which Minister Al Khatib informed Prime Minister Brisenio that funding was also approved to the government of Belize for a solar energy plant to be constructed. This will help Belize in meeting its energy needs. In international news, a Kenyan evangelical preacher, Paul Mackenzie Nthenge, is due in court in the coming hours after police exhumed the bodies of more than 200 of his followers, with more than 600 people still missing. Authorities have accused him of ordering his cult members to starve themselves to death so that they could meet Jesus. Al Jazeera's Malcolm Webb reports. Naomi Kahindi still remembers the songs about the looming end of the world that she used to sing in Pastor Paul McKenzie's church. She grew uncomfortable when he started preaching that schools and hospitals were the work of the devil and she left the church. Her sister and brother-in-law stayed. They went with Mackenzie to here, the remote forest settlement where he called his followers. Survivors say he ordered them to starve first their children and then themselves to death to go to heaven. Police have dug up more than 200 bodies, many of them children. Who are you? Who are you? Naomi's sister and brother-in-law were found alive and are in police custody. Naomi's wondering what's happened to their five children, her nieces and nephews. I'm worried and I'm not 100% sure I'll see them again. If the children haven't been found by now among those rescued, maybe they're among those being exhumed. We don't know. We're waiting for the DNA results. Mackenzie has been arrested several times and then released. Many people say he was paying off the police. About two months ago, he was finally detained here at the police station in the town of Melindi. The officers who'd previously released him have since been transferred. He's been held here while the police have started exhuming the bodies of his followers. Melindi's morgue has been filled twice over. The government's launched a commission of inquiry to find out what happened and is talking about regulating preachers. Pathologists have just completed a second round of post-mortems. We've done a total of 43 bodies. And uh, from what we saw, most of them were males and most of, most of them are also adults. People working at the site say hundreds more bodies are still buried in the ground and some appear to not be from here. Investigators say other people outside the cult may have been involved.
In sports, Jamaican Robert Samuels is under consideration to be part of the interim coaching staff for the West Indies women's team. Reports are that CEO of West Indies cricket, Johnny Grave, hinted that the board might return to the former Jamaican captain and coach. Samuels' notable performance saw him scoring 76 and 35 not out on a difficult Perth wicket in the 1996-1997 tour of Australia. In his second test against New Zealand in Antigua in 1995-1996, he smashed 125, reaching his 100 with a towering six down at the ground off Deepak Patel. The West Indies women are set to face Ireland in three ODIs and three T20s from June 26 to July 9 in St. Lucia. Time now for the entertainment news with Alicia Steele. Alicia, and I am elated to share some exciting, entertaining updates with you. In today's coverage, we will highlight Beyonce's performance of Scatterbarrel's popular Cool Dance Rhythm, as well as significant events such as the recent passing of Brutus from the Jolly Boys, plus an upcoming collaboration between Coil Array and Skillibang on June 23rd. Stay tuned for more engrossing news and updates. Scatterbarrel, the producer of the Coolie Dance Rhythm, is excited that Beyonce sampled the rhythm for her song Move on her Renaissance World Tour. The Coolie Dance Rhythm was released in 2003 and has been sampled by many artists including Lil John, Pitbull and Nina Sky. The rhythm has also been featured in several films and television shows. Scatterbarrel is grateful to Beyonce for sampling his rhythm and is proud that his music is reaching a wider audience. He is also excited to see how the Cooley Dance rhythm continues to evolve in the future. Dancehall artist Skillibang is featured on American rapper Coilery's upcoming album Koi, which will be released on June 23rd. Skillibang is featured on the song Radioactive, which is one of the 15 tracks on the album. Other collaborators on the album is David Guetta, Saucy Santana, Giggs, Lola Brooke, and James Brown. This isn't the first time Skillibang has collaborated with an international act. In late 2022, he was featured on Busta Rhymes' EP, The Fuse Is Lit. He also collaborated with Wizkid, DJ Khaled, Murma Massa, Pasiole, Narda Wick, French Montana, and 504in. Skillibang is signed to RCA Records and has been creating waves in the music industry for several years. His undeniable creativity and flow have earned his praise from critics and fans alike. Lenford Brutus Richards, the banjo player and former band leader of the famous mentor group, The Jolly Boys, passed away suddenly on Wednesday of last week. He collapsed at his home in Portland and was 67 years old. Richards had been discharged from Anata Bay Hospital two days earlier and had felt fit, according to his widow, Donna. He had been hospitalized for four days because he was getting tired quickly. Richards had received a serious diagnosis 17 years before and the doctors found that an old clot has persisted all those years. After his hospitalization, he felt better and got discharged. On Wednesday morning, he woke up well, drank some punch, and went to do some work in his office. Later that day, Donna heard a sound and found him lying on his back, unresponsive. Rest easy, Brutus, from the PBCJ family. Thank you for listening to PBCJ's E! News. I hope you enjoy the show. I would like to give a special shout out to Hair Addiction Collections. They offer high quality and affordable wigs with a wide range of styles to choose from. You can find them on Instagram at Hair Addiction Collections. Now remember to live an entertaining lifestyle and I'm your host, Alicia. 
Thanks, Alicia. And that's it for the news on PBCJ. Have a wonderful weekend.